All right, guys, now that we've talked about mitosis and the entire cell cycle, now we want to figure out how does a cell know when it's time to divide and when it's time to not divide. So how is the cell cycle regulated? All right, you are an enormous multicellular organism. You have billions of cells within you um, organized into tissues and organs, and the whole body has to coordinate when cells divide and when they don't to make sure that everything works properly. So it's important that your cells know when to divide so that you have normal growth, normal development, and normal maintenance. If your entire cell division stopped, anytime you got a cut, it would never heal because you would never grow new cells to close in that cut. That would be bad. Um, so we need to know when to divide cells and how fast to divide them. And not all types of cells can have the same length of a cell cycle. Okay. So we talked about the fact that different types of cells are going to um, divide at different times. In an embryo, the cell cycle is happening every less than every 20 minutes because you've got a lot of growing that has to happen from the moment you're fertilized until the moment you're actually born. You go from one cell to billions of cells just in a very short period of time. Okay, your skin, it, it, as a course of your adult life, your skin cells are the ones that are going to divide the most frequently. They have a cell cycle of only 12 to 24 hours. Liver cells are going to retain the ability to divide. Remember, they can get moved into that G0 phase and then pulled back out of it if necessary. And they may divide once every year or two, depending on if you need them. Okay? Mature nerve cells and muscle cells never, ever, ever divide. Once they hit maturity, they're done. So they're going to stay they're going to stay in the G0 phase permanently. All right. So how is the cell cycle controlled? Well, there are two irreversible points in the cell cycle that once you get past it, there's no going back. And the first one is when the DNA, all the DNA is replicated. Once you've replicated it, you've got now two copies, and this, that cell is going to have two copies. The only way to stop it from having two copies is to divide it in half and give each new cell a copy. Okay. And then the other one is the separation of those sister chromatids. Once you've separated them, you can't shove them back together. They only go apart. Okay? So the cell is going to have checkpoints that are going to decide, are we ready to replicate this genetic material? Can we do it? And then once everything's gone that far, then we'll have a moment of, is it ready? Are we set to separate? Go yes or no. Okay? So let's talk about a little bit about checkpoints. There are, um, so there, these are going to be stop and go moments. They're either going to say yes, keep going, or stop, don't go. There's three of them. There's one that happens between G1 and S. Okay. Oh, is the cell ready to begin replicating its DNA? The next one is between G2 and M. Is all the DNA replicated correctly? Are we ready to divide? And then the last one is a spindle checkpoint. It happens right before anaphase to make sure that all the chrom chromosomes are actually attached to a spindle fiber. Okay. So G1, the G1S checkpoint is the most critical. It's a primary decision point. Okay. If the cell receives a go signal, then it's going to go forward and try to divide. If it doesn't, it's going to go into the G0 phase and probably stay there forever. Okay? There's going to be all sorts of things that are going to help decide if a cell should go on. Is it big enough? Does it have not enough nutrition? And has it gotten external signals that let it know that division is actually necessary? So let's try to remember what the G0 phase is and get a little bit more detail about it. G0 is a non-dividing differentiated state. So most of your cells, all of your muscle cells, all your nerve cells are in a G0 phase. They will never divide from where they are. It's considered a resting phase, but it's not like the cell is sitting there doing nothing. It's going through its job of being a brain cell, being a muscle cell, whatever it might be. It's just never going to move past the G1. It's never going to replicate its DNA. It's never going to divide. Okay. Remember that your liver cells can be called back from a G0 phase um, depending on external cues and can divide. That's one of the reasons that you can do a living liver transplant, liver donation. They could take a third of your liver out of you, give it to someone else who obviously matches your type and all that, um, and then that piece of liver will grow into be a full liver in the new person and your liver will regenerate itself. Okay, so what's going to tell a cell that it's time to divide? It's going to get receive um, signals. Um, and signals are going to come into the cytoplasm. There's going to be some within the cell and some from outside of the cell. Signals in our cells are usually in the form of proteins. And they can be either activators that make something happen or inhibitors that stop something. Okay. 
Okay, so proteins inside the cells that are going to promote cell growth and division are considered go-ahead signals. And um, mo mostly they're going to be promoting factors, things that are going to make the cells start dividing. They're going to promote or encourage the process of mitosis. The cells also can be getting externals from the outside, meaning we need to grow, we need to replace, we need to do something. So those will be outside signals. Okay. The primary mechanism of turning these signals on or turning them off is phosphorylation. So as they get phosphorylated, as they get phosphate groups put onto them, they are turned on, ready to go, telling the cell it's time to go. Uh, so where do the phosphates come from? Hopefully you remember that the phosphates come from ATP. And this is one of the reasons why it requires so much energy to grow, is because the signals, in order to be turned on, have to get phosphorylated from ATP. Okay. The, remember, kinase enzymes are the type of enzymes that do phosphorylation. Okay. Okay. So the internal cycle, the internal signals that trigger a cell are called cyclins. Okay. And these are regulatory proteins that are going to have varying levels over the course of the cell's life. Okay. And CDKs are cyclin-dependent kinases. Remember, ACE, since an ACE. That means it's an enzyme, okay? Cyclin dependent means that it relies on cyclin to do its job. And since it's a kinase, that means that it phosphorylates things. So the more you start remembering these words, the more you're gonna be able to figure out what something does, okay? Um, and it's gonna phosphate, phosphorylate cellular proteins so that they're able to help out with cell division. Or the phosphorylation may inactivate some of them so they stop preventing cell division. Okay. The CDK um, cyclin complex is when the two get together, it activates it, and lets it get going. Okay, so how these work is that you've got a couple different internal s signals, cyclin and MPF. MPF stands for mitosis promoting factor. We're so good at naming things in biology. Um, and those levels are going to increase and get to their peak just as mitosis is happening. And then after mitosis has been successful, they're going to drop really, really low. And then over the course of a cell's life, they're going to build back up, build back up, build back up until they get to a high enough level that mitosis can happen again. And the cycle keeps repeating itself and repeating itself and repeating itself. All right, so where are these checkpoints again? Let's look at them all one more time. All right, so we've got the G1S checkpoint, and um, CDK and cyclin are going to have to be up to a certain level in order for the cell to reach this checkpoint. Um, so those are your growth factors. The cell is also going to check its nutritional state. Is there enough food? Is there enough ATP? So that there's enough energy to make this happen. And then also, is the cell big enough? Okay, the cell's got to be a big enough size so that when it divides in half, you don't end up with two micro cells. You need regular size cells. Okay, if all of those things are good, then on it goes to G2M. Okay, so that's going to check, has all of the DNA been replicated and has it been replicated correctly? So it's going to go through and check for proofreading. Remember, it won't be perfect. You're going to have about 30 errors for every cell cycle. But any, you know, that's pretty normal. Anything more than that in the cell is probably going to either shut down and go to G0 or, um, or uh, explode, do um, program cell death, apoptosis or it's going to break down and try to repair it if it's a small enough mistake. Uh, and then also, CDK, cyclin, is going to have to be up to another even higher level, and the cell is going to have to have enough of a concentration of MPF, that mitosis promoting factor. The last checkpoint is the spindle checkpoint, and it happens right before anaphase. As the cells, as the chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate, uh, each chromosome is going to be checked to make sure that it's really attached. And what the spindle fibers do is they pull. Okay, and they do a pull and a pull on every single chromosome pair, every single sister chromatid pair. And as long as there's tension on both sides, then that means that the chromosome is fully attached to the spindle fiber and they can keep going. Okay? If um, there isn't tension on both sides, then the entire spindle breaks down and regrows. Okay? And the uh, um, signal that's going to really help that happen is called APC or anaphase promoting complex. Again, very creative name. All right. So, um, remember that this cyclin CDK kinase, is, this is kind of the most important internal factor that's going to help the um, cell know when to divide. Once it gets up to a high enough level, then the cell is ready to divide. Now, the genes that make these proteins, because remember, all the proteins in your body all come from a gene, your DNA codes for it, well, these are really highly conserved proteins. This means that 
um, over millennia, the genes have stayed the same because they're so good at what they do that there's never been a pressure that allowed somebody else to live better with something different than what we had. So no, there's never been any natural selection that has, made, that has been able to make these genes better than what they already are. So yeast, insects, plants, animals all have the same genes for making CDK. Okay, so what about external factors? We talked about CDK and those internal factors. Now we need to look at external signals. How is a cell going to be told, yes, it's time to divide? All right, some of them are going to be, most of them are growth factors, and they're going to help coordinate between cells. One is density-dependent inhibition. When your cells are touching each other, they are told not to divide, and then you don't just get stacks and stacks and stacks of cells. That would be bad. Okay, but if there's a space in between cells, and cells are no longer touching each other, they will divide until they hit each other again. And that is why when you have a cut, imagine a paper cut, okay, you now have a break in your skin. The cells at those edges are going to start dividing and dividing and dividing until they touch each other again. Okay? And then they'll stop dividing. Anchorage dependence is also really important. Cells have got to be attached to something in order to divide. And that's a good thing, because that means that cells floating through your bloodstream can't just randomly start dividing. They have to actually be physically part of an organ, part of a tissue, in order to actually start that division process. Okay. So a growth factor is going to hit a, uh, a receptor protein on the surface of a cell, and that's going to send a message into the cell, and the cell is going to start making more CDK. And then once that CDK level gets high enough, the cell will go into mitosis. So even though this is an external factor, it still triggers that internal signal of CDK. All right, so growth factors. Mm, this is just an example. You can look over this later. But we've been able to use um, to stimulate cells to divide even in petri dishes when we give them the right kinds of growth factors. Um, this EPO is something, it's a drug that Lance Armstrong was accused of taking that was supposedly allowed him to make more red blood cells and therefore transport more oxygen and make him a better um, competitor. He was never really, it was never really proven. It was all kind of wishy-washy, but just to know what that is. All right, now, growth factors, if they send their messages wrong or if the messages get mixed up, this can create cancer. Remember that cancer is just mitosis gone bad. It is uncontrolled unstoppable cell division, making more, making too many cells. That is cancer. So we have genes that, regu that normally regulate cell division. Okay? Those are your growth factor genes. We call them proto-oncogenes because if they go wrong, if they get mutated in the right way, they can become cancer-causing genes, so oncogenes. So we call them proto- or pre-cancer genes because they have the potential of causing cancer. Okay? If this type of gene is switched on, it will cause cancer. So normally it is um, inhibiting cell division, it is stopping cell division from happening too much, but if it's switched on and left on all the time, it's just going to make cell division happen over and over and over and over again, and that's cancer. Okay? Tumor suppressor genes are genes that stop cell division from happening too often. If we turn these genes completely off, then that's going to cause cancer. It's going to stop everything that was holding um, cell division back. It's like turning off the brakes of a car. The car is just going to keep going. An example of a tumor suppressor gene is P53. We'll talk about that in a minute here. All right, so cancer, again, is unrestrained, uncontrolled cell growth. What has to be lost? Well, the checkpoints have to get screwed up. Um, P53, the gene P53, um, plays a key role in the G1S checkpoint, and in every cancer we've ever, ever found, P53 has been messed up. Okay. So if P53 is working, it's going to detect damage in your DNA, it's going to stimulate enzymes to fix the DNA, or it's going to force the cell to go into G0 and never ever divide. Okay? Or it's going to also keep it in a G1 arrest, or it's going to cause the cell to self-implode and literally cell suicide. Okay? Every cancer we've ever found has a shut down P53 gene. Okay, so here's your P53 gene, here's what could happen. So there's damage in your DNA that comes from the environment somehow. Heat, radiation, chemicals, whatever it might be. P53 should recognize that damage, and it gets the cell to stop and not divide until it has repaired that specific problem, and then it can go on and make normal repairs. 
if something's wrong with p53 then it's not going to get the cell or, or, or if it's too i'm sorry excuse me if it's too big of a mistake then the cell division is going to be stopped p53 won't be able to fix the problem and then it's going to trigger the cell to explode to literally blow itself up okay now, if P53 is, has gone bad, has been mutated or damaged in some way, shape, or form, it's not going to recognize the bad DNA, so that bad is going to get passed on and passed on and passed on, and that cell can turn cancerous. Okay, so there's several different things that have to happen in order for, it, in order for cells to actually be considered cancer. Cause cells go wrong. I mean, you have mutations that happen in your cells all the time, and most of them aren't a problem. But it's when all of these about six things go wrong that you actually get cancer. Okay? So your growth promoter genes have to be turned on. Okay, that means that your cells are going to keep growing and dividing no matter what. The cells have to somehow start ignoring the checkpoints, which usually means that P53 has been turned off. They're going to have to escape apoptosis, so somehow the suicide genes have been turned off. They're going to have to um, turn on chromosome maintenance genes because over time, as the chromosomes keep getting replicated and replicated and replicated, just the environmental things that you're exposed to are going to start wearing down and degrading those chromosomes. You have some genes that can do a little bit of maintenance, but they only work from time to time. Um, in cancer, those genes are usually turned on full force all the time, always taking care of your chromosomes, so the cancer cells can then live much longer and reproduce many more times than a normal cell. Okay. Also, cancer has to turn on blood vessel growth because now this collection of cells that started to grow, like this big old pile of cells over here, okay, this pile of cells is a, tu or is a tumor. Those cells have to have oxygen and glucose in order to stay alive, just like any other cell in your body. So blood vessels have got to grow to that area to feed it. It's one of the reasons that sometimes people will first notice that they have cancer after a big drop in their weight, they'll have a major weight loss experience because the nutrition that should be feeding other parts of your body is now feeding the tumors in their body. Okay? And then also the cells have to overcome anchor and de density dependence. So those touch sensors that normally would say, oh, I'm touching something, I'm crowded, don't let me, um, I don't get to divide, those get turned off and the cells just start piling up on top of each other. And that's what makes the growth of the tumor. And it is like an out-of-control car with many systems all failing at once. How can these happen? Well, mutations can happen for, from a lot of different, normally, environmental factors, like UV radiation, chemical exposure, radiation exposure, heat, cigarette smoke, pollution, age, genetics. So your age, as you get older, all your, you know, your systems just start to kind of slow down and wear down. So your ability to have checkpoints and um, really catch mistakes can kind of get damaged a little bit. Also, some people's genes are just more likely to get mutated. We don't necessarily understand the whole genetics of cancer yet, everything about it. But we do know that for whatever reason, some people, as they pass it on down their family, their genes are more likely to go bad. So that provides a genetic component of cancer. Um, but the thing that isn't a genetic component of cancer, remember, these mutations are happening to your body cells. It is your skin cells, your liver cells, your brain cells, whatever it is, it's your body cells that have been mutated and are being damaged. It is not your sex cells. So you cannot actually physically pass cancer on from parent to offspring. You can pass genes that are more likely to go bad, but you can't pass cancer on. So a mom could be pregnant with a baby, have cancer, and the baby would be born fine because it's the mom's body cells that are bad, not her actual eggs. Okay? All right. So there's um, a tumor is a mass of abnormal cells. There are two different types of tumors. There are benign tumors, which are abnormal cells that are going to stay in one spot. You take them out with surgery, you're fine, they don't come back. Okay? Um, most of the time they're not a big deal. The other type of tumors are malignant tumors, and these are the ones that can start spreading. They're going to leave their original site, they're going to break off, and they're going to start moving through the body and dividing in other places in the body. Okay? They're going to be carried by the blood and lymph, lymph system. That's your immune system vessels that travel in parallel to your blood. 
vessels, and they're going to start more tumors in other locations. So it may have started here, but then it ends up over here, or it ends up in your leg, or whatever. Um, we call that metastasis, when more tumors are happening. We always name a cancer based on where it started. So, for example, you could have skin cancer in your brain. If it started out as skin cancer and then moved through your body to your brain, um, because of the fact that the original cells were skin cells, we still call it skin cancer. Okay. Um, we have all sorts of different treatments that we've come up with now that can help treat cancer, right? High energy radiation, we look to that to actually kill rapidly dividing cells. Chemotherapy is going to stop DNA replication. So if DNA replication stops, you can't make more cells, so the cancer cells can't keep being made. The problem here with this is that you're also going to stop your other cells from being um, replicated, so that's one of the reasons that a person in chemotherapy can get sick so easily, is because their body's not able to repair from normal wear and tear. Okay? And it, but, this, but it is going to stop the cancer cells from dividing, and it's going to stop the blood vessels from going to those cancer cells, so the, maybe the tumor will get starved. Okay? And we've also started to come up with miracle drugs. Some doctors have found these, and these are a really great thing. These target specific proteins and enzymes that are only found in cancer cells. And so they work like a little heat-seeking missile, and they only destroy the cancer cells, which would be really, really great because radiation and chemo, they kill every cell they come into contact with, basically, they, or they impact every cell they come into contact with. So that's why they can make you so sick and be so hard on you. Um, but these types of drugs are actually looking specifically just for cancer cells, and they only destroy cancer cells. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you guys. See you next time.